Okay. All right. Uh, I guess it's it's uh, it's time for um, today's lecture, which I have really been looking forward to. And this is a lecture by our new employee Thomas Tackerson, who is a psychologist and um, actually a lot of things. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess at this point, but I will I will I will also introduce myself during the lecture. Okay. Thank you so much. For yeah. But the background is uh, Thomas got in touch with me. I'm Matthias Kaysen. I'm uh, a friend of the IMC and also a director of something called the Recreational Fear Lab. And Thomas got in touch about a year ago, yeah. told me he'd heard about the lab and the work we were doing and had some uh, ideas for new projects and collaborations. And um, the background of the Recreational Fear Lab itself is um, seed funding from the IMC. So years of uh, building a network where we could do empirical research on recreational fear which is activities in which people derive pleasure from fear. That uh, the strange phenomenon that many people find it enjoyable to be scared. Um, so really this whole thing grows out of um, collaborations and friendships that have been forged with the support of the IMC. Um, but I think we want to hear more about this project that you're working on. So, yeah. uh, so thanks everybody for showing up and also people uh, on Zoom. We're also very welcome to ask questions or give comments in the chat, and we'll get to them at the end of the lecture. Cool. All yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Matthias. Uh, yeah, so today I would like to talk to you about uh, our new project, which is situated at the Recreational Fear Lab called Apex of Fear. It stands for Affective Player Experience of Fear. So uh, the subtitle is Enhancing User Experience of Horror Through Affective Computing. And I'll get back to what we mean by effective computing and what we mean about enhancing horror. Um, yes, yeah, so this is this is our. Uh, wait, does this work? No. Okay. Well, I guess I'll use my. Or maybe it's because it's not selected. For a very technical product uh, project, it's bad to have problems with just PowerPoint. But uh, yeah, so I uh, I start off the presentation with just talking about a little bit who I am, since I'm a new employee here at Aarhus University. Um, I started in January, so it's still very, very, uh, but uh, again, Matthias and I had been working together on and off for a year now, um, and I, uh, basically, I'm the acting principal investigator on this Apex of Fear project uh, that's situated at the Recreational Fear Lab, so that's my, my day job, and then uh, by night, I work um, and teach um, FACTS workshops, so FACTS is the system we use to uh, decode facial expressions, it's originally made by uh, Paul Ekman and Wallace Friesen and jo uh, Joseph Hager. So it's a system for basically quantifying facial behavior. Uh, and so that's, uh, I'm currently uh, on the team that's revising the manual for release since the, the current version is the, <laughs> the materials that you're based on is basically learning from is uh, from VHS. So it has a little bit of um, an older look to it. So we want to update it and have more diversity. So that's. I'm doing that and then I uh, also teaching these facts workshops to uh, academics and uh, also people within the games industry who want to use it for uh, character animation for facial behavior um, but yeah so that's kind of gets me to the last point where I'm working by night as a consulting facts director at uh, Rockstar Games um, and so yeah so I um, I work mostly with, my research interests are VR, I come in a background, as Matthias mentioned, as a psychologist, but uh, my first job was at University of Southern Denmark, where I worked uh, in a lab called Emotion Lab, where we were, we got a, a grant from the, uh, the ERC for building adaptive learning simulations in VR, so basically using psychophysiology, uh, mostly EEG, to measure uh, user states and uh, learning states in, in real time. So this is something like cognitive loading and engagement, and then tailoring the difficulty of the learning materials depending. So that's, that's where I started, uh, and that's kind of what started this, uh, my fascination with VR and the potentials. Back then it was very new. Today we are fortunate enough that the technology has moved along and has, has become more, a lot more accessible. And the same goes for psychophysiology. It's also my background. And originally I trained as an actor before getting into psychology. Uh, and so I, I had this uh, appreciation for emotions and, uh, and also felt the, the frustrate, frustration of not a, understanding what actually emotions is so that's kind of why I went into psychology is to understand emotions and then led me to working with psychophysiology and then 
you know, I, I've always been a gamer and always played video games, so it's been kind of natural for me to move this interest of uh, VR and psychophysiology into using it in games. Uh, so that's kind of just a little bit about my background. Um, I work, um, I do all kinds of, as Matthias says, I, I wear a lot of different hats. Even though I'm a psychologist, I mostly work with tech these days and work uh, with building uh, games and building uh, different simulations. So for instance, I have made a little simulation here that recreates the, using eye tracking in VR that recreates uh, the, what happens to our eyes when they converge. So basically we have this in, naturally when we look at something, our eyes converge and then it comes in focus. In VR you can't do that because the screen is always static at certain points, so your eyes can't converge on the object. So this is a test of what would happen in VR if we enabled convergence through uh, eye tracking. And so this is a little test of, of that. And then I also work on making very specific things for this Apex of Fear project, which I'll mention more about. This is a spider. We've been training how to walk, uh, not using animations, but using something called inverse kinematics and machine learning. So they're basically, they're basically not animated. They're just moving their legs, like figuring out where the ground is and then moving along. So these are the kind of things that I, I'm doing in my spare time. And then I'm also the lead developer of uh, the, L the world's first VR LGBTQ plus museum, uh, which premiered last year. Um, it's basically a museum where, where the goal was to give voices to this marginalized group of LGBTQ plus, where we uh, photo scanned personal objects and attached the stories in a VR environment that you can visit in a, in a museum setting. So you can hear the stories. Um, and then I also worked at a company called iMotions where I developed eye tracking solutions uh, for mostly for uh, marketing or neuromarketing. So in this case, it's um, showing how we can map from a virtual VR uh, marketplace or like a store onto a 2D image of the shelf. So we can work with it in a normal eye tracking manner where you can have gaze maps and high heat maps. So this is, so my background is mostly as a developer and, and, and tech, even though I trained as a psychologist. Um, but yeah, so the Apex of Fear project, which is why I'm here today, uh, is basically, as Matthias mentioned, this new project that, we, uh, that we've started with uh, uh, in our collaboration, but it actually stems from the collaboration that Recreational Fear Lab has had with Dystopia Entertainment, which is their haunted house facility in Weile. Um, they have been doing research for a number of years now and been doing this very exciting, more ecological research where you know, measuring in an actual situ in people running around in this haunted maze. Um, and that's kind of what sparked this idea of doing the, uh, the Apex of Fear project, uh, which is very much about the, you know, m measuring and capturing data in an ecological set uh, setting. So basically, the, the, just on a higher level, the Apex of Fear project is basically we are planning on combining VR with psychophysiology and, uh, and horror to build this next generation of horror uh, media where we're basically tailoring the experience to the individual person's uh, phobias and, uh, and, and reactions based on the physiology. So, um, so we're basically combining my interest in VR and psychophysiology with Matthias's uh, and the Recreational Fear Labs background of showing the benefits both intrapersonal and intrapersonal uh, that horror can have. So in both the bonding, but also the learning to cope. So it's obviously a, a threat simulation, which can, has, it, has its benefits. So that's what we're building. We have been given a grant by the Innovation Fund through their uh, program called Inner Explorer. Um, and as far as we know, we're the first kind of arts projects that has gotten money for this grant, which is a huge honor. And, and uh, we, we're definitely uh, very excited to have the possibility of turning this project into terrifying reality and taking, um, you know, we have, we have until the end of the year uh, to build and launch a, a project, uh, a product that can run uh, at the Disturbia facility in one of their warehouses. So it's basically, uh, I'll get into more specific about the, the actual experience, but we, uh, it's basically the idea is that we want to evaluate whether adding effective computing, so adding physiology and having the game adapt in real time uh, to the individual, individual person actually has any uh, both commercial interest and, and so, so that's kind of the, the background of this uh, grant is that it's, 
it's it's not a typical research grant. It's basically taking research we've already done and then turning it in and trying to evaluate that it has uh, commercial applications. So this this is very much the background of this project. Um, our interest and in, is also showcasing that we can create this data pipeline where we gather physiological data um, that can, from 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 an ecological setting in the warehouse where people would be you know, paying customers coming into the to our uh, facility and playing this game and then we will gather data throughout and using that data to train machine learning algorithms to make uh, our effective computing or our mach our emotion recognition software better. So so that's the idea and that this stems from the, the fact that currently emotion recognition has actually gotten quite good uh, when p performed in a lab. We are reaching up to I think uh, like north of 80% uh, in accuracy across the basic seven basic emotions uh, in terms of classifying them. But the problem is that these algorithms all seem to fail once you bring them out into an ecological setting where it's not as you know controlled as when you're sitting in a lab. So and the reason for that is because the data is trained on lab data. So this project is showcasing that you can gather data and train algorithms that work in a real life environment with real players. Uh, so that's the background. And also uh, to quote, and I, I, I don't, yeah, Guillermo del Toro, who is the film director, um, to learn what we fear is to learn who we are. And that's basically the goal of this project is to use what we fear and measuring uh, the res f people's fear responses during the, this horror game to figure out, uh, predict how they react in a game. So it's basically this idea of player modeling. So taking, uh, using fear to predict players' behaviors in a, a video game. Um, so yeah, so that's, that was the, this is more specific, this slide is more specifically about the actual experience. So basically, it's a VR experience that we are planning to, will take around 90 minutes from start to finish. And it's uh, marrying the best of both worlds, so both of the physical world and the virtual world. So we're using, instead of in VR, I don't know if anyone tried VR, but there's normally this artificial movement where you can teleport around because you don't, normally have the space to actually move around. But the way we're doing it is we're tracking three players in this multiplayer experience in a warehouse scale facility. So they have 10 by 20 meters where they, there's no artificial movement. They physically have to move around with their bodies. So that's also showcasing that technology has come far enough that we can measure physio physiology without having them sitting still and keeping their head. So you know, when, if anyone has worked with physiology and especially EEG, you know, you've been told as uh, you're telling the respondents to please don't move your head throughout this experience, please don't, you know, if you could not blink, that would be great. And so, so that's, I mean, so this is testing whether it's possible to uh, develop algorithms and train them with machine learning to, to filter out this real time uh, noise that happens when you're moving around. Uh, and here I have a little bit of a uh, showcase of what technologies we're using. So we're using a, a facial mask that's put inside the VR headset which measures the, upper, uh, the facial expression from the upper face. So it's based on EMG. Uh, and I, there's it's measuring from four different sites. And then we have uh, eye tracking, which is built into most of the high-end high VR headsets these days. So that one is basically consumer grade. And then we also have heart rate coming from this mask. And then we have um, muscle activation of the tra trapezius muscle, which is the muscle in the back. Uh, on your on your shoulder, which is basically what you're tensing when you, you know if you're watching a horror game, you feel like your shoulders are crawling up to your ears. That's basically what we are planning on using as a surrogate or an operationalized measure of suspense. So this is also something. This is very experimental in the sense that it's not really. There's not a lot of literature on using the trapezius muscle for for horror, uh, but this is something again would be really interesting to look at. And then we are also uh, including respiration measures and electrodermal activity, which is uh, sweating in the, specifically in the, in the hands is where it's being measured, and skin temperature in the hands. So here's a, an image of the insert inside a VR headset. You can see there's a, the different zones for the EMG. Um, and we are doing this project in collaboration with a company called MTech Labs, who is supplying this facial insert they're developing. So we are, we are helping them uh, you know, figure out the use case of using this in, in an actual game. And, and supplying them with uh, data for training them, the emotional AI. Um, and then we're also using a, a, a haptic vest from a company called Ogo. These, these are all um, not something that you can just go out and buy currently. They're in, in, in development, uh, but we have been fortunate enough to be part of their development projects. 
Um, so this vest is basically, uh, if you've seen those ads on infomercials where you can like train your abs without having, uh, without doing exercises. So this is basically what it, it's doing. It has these EMS sensors or electrical muscle stimulation. It's placed at 10 places around the body. So we can basically, if someone was hit in VR, we can force them to contract the muscle so they'll feel like they're getting hit in that position. So we are adding, hopefully adding that feeling of physical uh, presence or like, um, that extra feeling of having something at stake, you know, I see it as the same as, you know, if you play laser game, uh, you have a, you're shooting your friends and that could be fun and you're shooting them with lasers, but it's just not the same as if you're playing paintball, you are less likely to just like stick your head out, you know, you'll, you'll think twice. And that's kind of what we want to achieve here is that have that feeling of personal stake because that will be important for, uh, for, for eliciting emotions in horror. And then, so I want to, Briefly, just go through uh, the physiology of fear, which is kind of the reason why we've chosen these sensors. Um, it might sound like a lot to, ha to have these sensors on, but I've, I have, uh, just to showcase how it would look, this is the Oro vest. It's very tight, but that's kind of point to make sure we have the sensors. So basically, these are all the sensors that the players will be wearing. So there is uh, EDA, so electrodermal activities measured from the wrist. And then we have, uh, so this is sweating, so you know if you are a, uh, if you're going to a job interview or an exam or something, you, you, you feel your hands getting clammy and cold. So the, the clamminess, the, the perspiration is what we're measuring with these sensors. And then the, the fact that they're getting cold because the, the blood rushes from uh, you know, your extremities to the larger locomotion muscles to facilitate this action of flight, which is what fear is supposed to help us do. Uh, we have a, a temperature sensor that's also attached. And then we have... Uh, the respiration belt, which is also holding the device, and then we have uh, the trapezius muscle, which is the EMG sensor here, where I have my uh, baseline attached on my on my spine. It's it's it it looks like a lot, but this doesn't it took me like five minutes to put on before going in here, and that's kind of also what we want to show that it's not it's not as obtrusive as you might think. We, you know, when you think doing physiological uh, studies, you know, people again, people sitting still, they're wired up. All this is is wireless even the headset i'll also show you i have a a non-vr uh prototype for which we've been free printing on to to for how this uh vr in headset insert looks so there's all these so you get this on and then you're basically ready to go so I'll, I, this has a bit of a magneto look but like an x-men but so this is basically the full kit normally that would obviously be a vr headset instead on top uh, but this is basically what the players will be doing, uh, will be wearing throughout. And this corresponds to, you know, you can see the, the facial expression of fear, which is a raise of the eyebrows, which is measured from the from talus muscles, which we can you measure from uh, from these this muscle in the middle, uh, from this in the middle. And then we have uh, the curigator muscle, which is pulling the eyebrows down together. So this is the characteristic fear eyebrow. It's up and, and then together. Um, and then we have the ocular, uh, the ocular uh, uh, motion, so like with the eyes opening up from uh, ocular, uh, ocular, ocular, ocular eyes, ocular is what it's called. Um, and then we have the horizontal stretch of the mouth, which is like this. And that, that we can't measure because we don't have any sensors down there, but that's just that you can see it on this young woman's face. She's being jump scared in a facility in, I think it's Las Vegas, maybe. Um, but yes, these are, these are the, the reason why we chose these sensors is because they are all connected to the, the physiological change that happened during fear. Um, and just a brief talk, uh, introduction to how we go about measuring and deciding, uh, you know, how we, how, how we come about the, the measurement of fear. We are using this uh, multi-dimensional emotion model, which is basically mapping uh, the physiology onto uh, two axes. So we have uh, the valence and we have, uh, sorry, the valence and we have arousal. So basically, um, each of it, these different emotional states will be mapped onto uh, this coordinate system, and we're using we're using the uh, you can see for instance a, f a fray, which would be fear in this case um, is on the negative axis, and then high in arousal. So the, re the the way we are deriving that is the, the electrodermal activity, which is the sweat from from uh, from some measure from my wrist in this case, uh, is basically that has been shown to linearly correlate with arousal. So that's one thing that we use to get this dimension. And then we are, we are 
we are checking that with uh, from the using the the photoplasmograph, which is basically measuring heart rate through uh, basically sending a light out and seeing uh, what light comes back. So when blood rushes through, in this case, it's measuring the forehead. When blood rushes through, the light is blocked, and therefore, you know, we can measure when blood is rushing, and that's uh, surrogate for the heart rate. And uh, and then we are using respiration as well, which is also uh, I don't know, Mark, do you yeah, yeah, I just have a question. Yeah. So, um, so are you saying that you are in, like inferring a subjective measure on the basis of physiological and behavioral measures? Yes. Okay. So basically, we are we are arriving at fear, which I I mean, which is a subjective experience. Uh, but we are basically using in the beginning, since we we don't have data yet, so we can't use uh, data driven machine learning models. So currently, we're using rule based systems to do it, and we're basing that off of uh, our, the theoretical understanding and the literature showing what what kind of um, physiology is connected to fear. So we are not again. This is not necessarily a research project. So we are not uh, we are not in the first place. We're not doing uh, studies to to validate the whether it's corresponding to a subjective measure in the first place. But we but that's something that once we will run the study, when we start running and collecting data, this is something that will be will be part of it is obviously having uh, collecting the survey data uh, or having real time annotation of the the experience of fear um, but yeah so th that is the point is to to come as close as we can to the experience of fear for measuring the uh, physiologically um, and then because arousal can also you know if you're high in arousal you can also be experiencing anger for instance that's also uh, and the, or excitement that's why we are adding this uh, this valence uh, dimension as well, which is where we're using the uh, the facial electromyography um, to check. You know, as we were talking about, with the with the fear expression looks different than the the happy expression. So, so those two. So that's kind of to help us decide where we are on this uh, axis, and then also using uh, the the heart rate measure because it's sensitive towards both uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system responses, which is both this calm and exciting uh, uh, scale. Yes, yeah, so that's basically. But you know, uh, even if we are, even if we decide on where we are, and uh, we are in a negative scale, and we are high in arousal, so it could also be anger. So that's why we've added these fear-specific measures. So we've added skin temperature because in anger, uh, we you see that skin temperature in the hands raise uh, or increases, whereas in fear it decreases. So that's one way of. So we we kind of using the, all these different measures in a multimodal setting to, to help us uh, you know, weed out the different other emotions to get as close to, to, we can as, fear, to fear as we can. Um, so that's, and for the same reason we're using the EMG and the trapezius and also because you know, activating the shoulders is, is a good surrogate because that's one of the gross, be gross motor behaviors of, of fear is like this protecting the vulnerable area of the neck by lifting the shoulders up. So that's something we're measuring as well. Um, but yeah, so the, the project, uh, again, we are we're aiming to measure your fear. And the reason why we're doing this is because uh, a, re a recent review from, from our team has, has shown that uh, effective gaming, as it's called, this idea of adding physiological measures to games, uh, leads to higher immersions and leads to higher levels of enjoyment and fun and emotional engagement, so that's why it's meaningful to even look at this. But while that being said, there is not a widespread uh, adoption of f effective gaming yet. Uh, there's two games that I can think of that actually is commercially available that uses heart rate trackers and adapts the game based on having you know a polar uh, heart rate belt that you use for running or or using uh, an Apple smartwatch or something uh, as uh, as input. Um, but it's not something that's widespread yet, and that's what we want to see, you want to see whether it is actually ready for for prime time so this is the purpose of the project um and as i spoke about briefly we are we don't have currently this is the 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 model that we are aiming for at the end is basically that we're using machine learning models uh and then some some rule based or theory based uh inferences to arrive at where they are on this uh, affect grid so this is uh, from a previous study from our team we showed that fear is not surprisingly in this part of the grid, and especially uh, these are the intensities. So, so that, you know, this is, this is what we are 
aim to do over time. So we have we will be able to in real time get data for each of the player and adapt the experience. So imagine that one player um, seemingly is afraid of, of spiders. We can add spiders or take spiders out depending on how we want to manipulate their arousal. But I'll get back to that. Um, but the idea is to use physiolog physiological measures in this effective game loop, which where we are taking in data and then we are feeding that into the game and changing the game depending on what we're measuring. But we are also using the, the measures for input mapping, which is basically, I don't know if any of you have played like a shooter game where you have to click shift to hold the character's breath so you can aim with a sniper or something. Um, in this game, where when you are being chased by a monster and you have to hide, instead of pressing shift to hold your breath, you physically have to hold your breath and we are measuring whether you're doing that through the respiration belt. Uh, so, so that's one way of like using it as a direct controller. Uh, and then we are also feeding the, the data back into the players. So for instance, that could be, uh, that, you know, that's the idea of biofeedback. So having a heart rate fed back, their own heart rate fed, fed back into the player in real time uh, when they're in scary situations. These are, these are some of the tools in our, that we're using uh, to develop this um, experience. And right here we have it. This is a, a screenshot from the demo we built for uh, when we were applying for, for the funding for Innovation Fund. We built a single player experience just showcasing that we could tailor uh, the experience based on measuring, this, uh, measuring on the effect grid and having these uh, inferences about emotional intensity. Uh, yep. So I'll briefly just go through that. The idea of the experience is that we want to build something uh, where it makes sense to, because physiological sensors have a lot of calibration attached to them. There's a lot of, you know, you have to uh, have people both put on the equipment, but also uh, have, you know, we have to expose them to different stimuli to get closer to what they seem to be reacting to. So we have to do like almost a little like a brainwashing sequence from different different stimuli uh, from different phobias so it could be like you know they put on a VR headset and they will be seeing a spider for five seconds and they will see uh, they'll be they will see that they're far down if we're testing for fear of heights and going through the different phobias uh, and so so there's a lot of calibration but we want to have that make sense with the story so that the narrative actually starts from you know when they're actually arriving at the facility so in this in this uh, experience our narrative is that uh, you're signing up for a clinical trial of this new sleep study that can, where you, we can use all this fancy equipment that they're put on to basically cut down sleep from eight hours to one hour. So it's basically, so that's the kind of the shtick or the gimmick behind it that you, you uh, we are testing this new equipment that can, that can cut down how much sleep you need. And then we are, we are, we are using it kind of as an escape room uh, in, in terms of the setting. We have this, the first floor, which is uh, a hide and seek, which is a very, um, you know, common recreational fear activity and something that we all recognize. Uh, so the players in this will have to find some, some items through in this, in this maze, in this physical space. And then once they've done that, they'll proceed to the second floor, which is more of an escape room, uh, like the Danish TV show, uh, Found in a Performer, where there's like different rooms they have to get into with certain challenges they have to solve in time to, to get out. And the last one is, is a more action-packed uh, zombie shooter Part. So this is the these are the three floors that we plan in terms of the gameplay. I won't dwell dwell into this too much, but just to give you an idea of what the actual part would be in the end. And then, so the way it works um, is that we are basically building an a AI horror director that can take in this data from the physiological sensors and then trying to uh, map or change the 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 kind of the narrative arc or like the intensity of the horror throughout. So we're following this model of basically uh, having the, the horror director going be between four uh, different states. So we have them going into relax and then into a increase and then our apex or the peak of a horror uh, and then fall. So these are the structures you normally see in horror is that you, you have this build up and then a release and then you get to relax a little bit and then another build up and a release. So this is basically the structure we'll be doing using so the the AI will continuously uh, you know when we are when you when you want to rise up to an apex it will start manipulating the lights for the players, start the lights will flash, or the sounds will be the ambient sound, the music will be more intense, or it will pick the content. So like we're planning on constructing this kind of uh, gradual exposure hierarchy where you know depending on what you seem to react to most of the calibration it will pick uh, content from that hierarchy to 
if you want something, if you want to then have lo uh, lower arousal response, we'll pick something lower, and we want something higher, we'll pick something high up on the hierarchy. Uh, and then it also controls when the actual, when they've reached what we perceive to be the apex, and then it will trigger an event. And the apex is based on this research that Matthias and, and, and Mark has done on uh, the sweet spot of fear. So this idea that there is a, uh, a certain threshold where fear is, where, fear, where the experience of fear maximizes fun. So like the intensity of the fear you're experiencing is correlated with a maximum amount of fun. Uh, so and you can see that this is uh, like any other construct within psychology, it's an inverted U shape-ish. So uh, we have, so you can see there's a certain point where it starts dropping off and this is where we want to have the apex. So this is, once we build up to that point, we will trigger the release, in, which in most horror games is some sort of jump scare, something that pops up out of nowhere and, and scares you. Um, so this is, this is kind of the idea is to build this horror director per se that can, can control the narrative. Uh, throughout and control for each of the players and and I think it's important to mention that I'm of course not doing this alone it's a it's an, a very ambitious endeavor in the first place uh, but we have a luckily we have a team of experts to also help and supervise the project uh, we have Matthias who you know who I won't spend time introducing and then we have Jonas who is the uh, owner or co-owner of the Dystopia Haunted House in Violet where uh, he's helping us in terms of designing the actual content of the experience and also helping us figure out you know, how, what's the best approach for measuring the commercial interest of this product and figuring out how we best navigate this industry. And then we have uh, George Yanakakis, who is a professor at the University of Malta. He specializes in effective computing, uh, so measuring emotions, uh, teaching the computer to measure emotions and, um, and using that in games. And then we have uh, Riga Mandrik, who is a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, who uh, did her PhD with EA Games, who is kind of, where she was kind of one that started this idea of using effective measures in games. Uh, so we were very fortunate to have her on board as well. Um, and then we have Leonard Nake, who is also a, a, a professor at the University of Waterloo and works with uh, games user research, especially, specifically within uh, human-computer interaction. And, and he will help us uh, this designing our evaluation of this product in the, in the end once we've, you know, once we've taken players through it, you know, how do we evaluate whether it's better than an experience without effective computing and so forth. So that's the team behind it. I just briefly want to mention because this seems like, it, you know, this is talking about horror games, but it actually does have other applications that you can, you can use it for. Um, so uh, for, for instance, Netflix recently, I think maybe a year and a half or two years ago, released this interactive movie on uh, on their platform called Bandersnatch from the Black Mirror universe, set in the Black Mirror universe, where you basically use your uh, phone or some sort of controller to make choices throughout the, the video or throughout the film to change the narrative. What we're suggesting is that you can use this technology to not only in games, but also in movies or any other kind of media and change narrative not based on, uh, you know, the conscious uh, decisions of the player but using more unconscious uh, measure, using physiological measures to do these choices in real time so that's also what we're testing and it also of course has since we basically what we're doing is building a, a threat simulation that's what recreational fear is as Matthias mentioned um, so we basically they, it has applications for for conducting exposure therapy in VR uh, where it's very important to measure whether and what levels of arousal a certain person is because that is correlated with the effectiveness of the treatment. So we, uh, we're thinking that this tool and this, these algorithms that we're developing can also be used uh, in more in a clinical setting. And then uh, it can of course be used in neuromarketing for measuring people's responses to consumer products. Uh, and the physiological measures are already used like that, but what, what we're suggesting is that we would have a, more of a plug and play that would spit out an emotion recognition in the end. Uh, so that will be useful if you're evaluating a new game or a, a movie or a, a new product design on, on a new soda can or something. Uh, and then it's also useful in research, which is obviously the interest of us. And we're currently conducting, actually using the pipelines built for the Apex of Fear project in a study currently running, uh, actually started yesterday here, uh, being run out of Matthias's office. Uh, and so, or, or, uh, or a study, but we're, we're using the, the methodology. So, 
that's just to say that there's also research projects that happens throughout the duration of this project. Um, but yeah, this is that was kind of my uh, what I wanted to to mention today about. I can't move. I think maybe my computer first, but I think the next slide will just be yeah Q and A. So any questions? Uh, and really, thank you for listening, and thank you for inviting me to 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 present this project. I'm very pleased to be able to join this this family of researchers, and I, I'm looking forward to collaborating, hopefully.